It's Monday. It's Monday. It really is. Seven o'clock. And that can mean only one thing. It's time for Reading the Signs, where me, comedy John Ryan, and my comedian pals from all over the world are going to be talking about comedy, well-being, why we do it, how we do it, how we cope. And that's where we need your help. We need you to send us your top tips for well-being. Be part of the show. Drop a comment in the box on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter on the mensradiostation.com website. It's going to be a great show, much better than last week. What we're trying to do is think exceptional, which, funnily enough, is the motto of WJ, our show sponsors. WJ are the UK's leading road marking and highway maintenance company. They're working with us, we're working with you. Let's get to it. <laughs> Good evening. I uh, hope everyone is well. It's Monday night, so... Uh, welcome along to another episode of Reading the Signs with me, John Ryan. And my beard, my beard's coming on. What do we think? You know, I'm going for that wild Irish rover look. And with the dark jumper, I feel like I'm a, a spokesperson for like some terrorist organization. Let's get this light sorted. Um, how's your week been? How's your day been? What you've been up to? Do let us know what's happening in your world. P- put your comments in a little comment box on Facebook or on Twitter. Or wherever you are, I'm gonna wrestle with this lamp. This isn't good at all, is it? Not very professional. Let's get it up there. So uh it's still January, it's still cold and damp and frosty, just the way I like it. Um, the weather, as we know, isn't always good for everyone. For me, it's a great day because it's cold and wet and muggy. For you, that may be horrible, and we all experience the same day, but it affects us differently, and that's the thing with well-being as well, isn't it? We all experience the same thing, but we all take different things from it. So how's, I'm actually looking, I can see my reflection, I'm starting to look like Jim Royal. Uh, before Nick starts or anyone else points it out, I will mention it first. Yeah, I've got this very Jim Royal look about me. Ah, so I'm going have a go like that. There you go. So, um, yeah, great uh, week we've had so far this week in my house. We've got to get in ready for that last push on the building work, um, just sorting out the floors. Um, no Darren today because it's his birthday. So a little happy birthday to Darren if he's out there listening. Got an amazing guest for you guys tonight. Um, um, it's a real treat, actually. It's what, it was always one of my favourite acts to work with, um, but our careers went in different directions, so it not happened that uh, often since. But he's one of these people who may not see him for a week, a month, or a year, but whenever I do bump into him, it's just like I saw him yesterday. He's one of the most interesting characters in my life, and anyone who knows me will tell you that I've got a proper collection of. Um, characters shall we say but this guy griff griff is he, he tops a lot really his book uh that he's bringing out uh, i was king of spain is you can't put it down it's just a dip in and dip out memoir of his life and he's probably had loads more things happen to him since he's he's written it so we're going to talk to him a little bit about that we're also going to talk to him about his comedy career how he was never a pop superstar but if he had been bros wouldn't have got a look in before we go any further, a quick hello to Robert Van Buren. Thanks for coming along, Rob. Always good to have your support, mate. Thanks for your continued listening. Um, if anyone else is out there, if, while you're listening to us on Facebook or on Twitter or on any of the other ways of doing it, all that social media malarkey, do let us know that you're out there. Give us a little follow. Do let us know what you've been up to and how you're engaging with the show and all the other shows that are on the station. So um, Griff is the sort of guy who you just get stuck with this guy at a party and you are in for a good time. Uh, you just know that he's going to entertain you and engage you. And I'm hoping that's what he's going to do for us for the next hour. So if I can ask you all to please give a, a nice warm welcome to the man himself. Um, it's an absolute pleasure, as I say. It's Griff. How's that, mate? Hello, John. Well, well, that was a very nice intro. I suppose it's all down here from now, mate. It's all down here. No. Not- <laughs> Not at all. We look like we're kind of uh, albino versions of each other. You've got like a well-lit room. I'm in this... Yes. Yeah, yeah. What's going well, on? I'll, well, I would have gone for the darker look, but uh, I think you only go dark when you're not when you're not so pleased about the way your beard looks. And I'm well, fairly happy with today. I've never really been able to grow beards, but last January I tried to do one, and then it got too itchy, so I gave up. But I'm determined to... I like the afro one. look. You had that afro look on the cruise. My- the <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That was our mate Lindsay has um, kept us really entertained during lockdown and since. 
just turned up last week with some Afro wigs. And so we oh, I love in. a wig, mate. I, 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 if we go away anyway, me and the lads, I always take a bag of wigs. Always got a bag of wigs. I love them. I used to wear a bit of carpet on my head for about a year. I had a bit of carpet, and they used to sing, sing to me at Palace. <laughs> carpet, carpet, give us a wave. And I used to wear a bit of carpet on my head, yeah, for, eight, for oh, about a year and a half. Don't ask me uh, why. And, and so, is, what's the, is Palace, is that, is that the team for you? Is that, are they, is that your yes, boys? Yes, I'm a Palace fan, yes. We've all been, uh, we've all been uh, commiserating each other because we got stuffed by, by Liverpool because they, they cheated. But I would be saying that. It, it was, uh, do you follow football, John? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I'm for my sins. Irish Catholic family, Man United, Celtic. That's it. I had no choice. So I've had many well, we're, great... Because we're, we're, we're all crying. It's, it's got to be your local team. It's Crystal Palace through and through, mate. Uh, well, I do go and watch Orient. That's my kind of... Uh, that's, that's my attempt at some sort of neutrality. But I was brought oh, okay. up... Is that, is that where you live, that way? It's that that way, yeah. I was brought up halfway between Arsenal and Tottenham. So we used okay. to go half one week, Spurs the next week. Sometimes popped out to Orient as well. Um, but what was that, it was, Hackney sort of way, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was Hackney, yeah. But my dad, his thing was, in this house, we support Manchester United. If you're good at sport, you play for Ireland and you listen to what your mother says. And then uh, <laughs> when my kids were born, he had the same speech, but he said, in this family, you support Manchester United. And if you're any good at sport, you play for Ireland and you always do what your grandmother says. So uh, Did, Were you any good at sport? Yeah, I was actually. It was pretty handy. Um I actually I was telling someone about this last week that um, I was in a school cricket team, got picked okay. to play for the got picked to play for the borough. My dad won't let me well, play because it was an empire game. It was a what? Uh, it, was a, it was an empire game, and he was a very oh, proud Irishman. And uh, I'm like, but I've been chosen. It's like a real big thing. He went, no, nope, not playing it. And uh, oh, okay. yeah, it, it was very bizarre. You can't really sneak out a cricket bat. Um, no, well, we, we the school I went to, we didn't really play much cricket or stuff like that because it was a pretty rough school, and um, we we only had sort of half a bat and one one uh, uh, one pad, you know. And it, it, it usually ended up in a fight with the other team anyway. So, <laughs> but I did play basketball for the first three years. Our our school was very good at basketball. My school was, yeah, and we won the Surrey Cup actually when I was eleven or twelve. That was quite good. Look at that. So tell us when you how how do you fit in with your siblings? Are the eldest, the youngest, the middle? Where do you fit in? Well, I was uh, in the middle of two. Um, I, my, my older brother, unfortunately, he he, uh, he we, we kind of retired at the same time. I retired when I was thirty eight, and he retired when he was forty. And he had ten years when all he did was drink himself to death. So th that's what actually brings him back to the the family home because we moved back in here to try and help him. But it, it, his his alcoholism was so destructive. I don't know if you've ever come across it. It's not just like someone being pissed. It, it was heartbreaking and we couldn't help him. And he, it, it ended one way and it was going one way. So, so this, well, that was my was older... It, was it just the two of you? No, I've got a younger brother who's, uh, I think he's nine years below me. But they, it's almost like I was an experiment, John. I went to... Um, <laughs> yeah, honestly, that's, I'm getting them back. And I am. It's, it, I, I went to uh, like a, a rough primary school in a council estate and then to various comprehensive schools and at this time both my elder brother and my younger brother were sent through private education from reception class uh, pri you know primary school up to university you know so in fact that's their, their sports facilities were, were amazing compared to ours but I, like I say I'm sure I was an experiment. So how did you fit in then as a kid was you the funny one or the lively one or you all a bit well, everyone was different. Everyone, you know, my, my brother, my older brother was very talented. He used to sing. And my younger brother's brilliant at cricket. He's now some kind of chairman for the MCC, would you believe? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we've all, we, but each each person has their different ways. Now, I only had one son. So, I, you know, but what I did was, we and my ex-wife, we worked our asses off to put him through private schooling because we didn't want him to have the same education that we both had. I wanted yeah. him to have, just, just, they, 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 their peers are different. Their outlook's different. You know, their, their aspirations are different. So we sent him to uh, private schooling and he's done very well for himself, but he speaks like Boris Johnson. What, just in riddles? Hello, sir. I'm <laughs> <love you. laughs> he now lives in Munich, actually. He lives in Germany, which okay. is lovely. Pretty wide out. We got a little hello shout out from uh, Peter Fermo. Um, oh, Pete Fermo. Yes, sir. He's, yeah. he's the bass player in my band. Hello, Pete. Look at, look, look at this boy here, Pete. Look how well he's doing, all the showbiz. This is next stop, Jonathan Ross for this lad. <laughs> I don't know about that, mate. <laughs> you, also got a, you also got an apology from uh, James Sharp, I believe, about the Liverpool game. So, uh, you know, oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. It, 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 
it, it's Clattenburg, mate. It's a cheat. But what do you do? What do you do? It is, isn't it? So tell us, as a kid, it, were you always it, laughing it, and joking about? Were you always funny? Were you always full of mischief? Well, my mum and dad say I was, but I can't really remember that. Uh, yeah, we moved from the other side of London to Surrey, and all of a sudden there were trees, and I was out on my bike and making camps and stuff. But I, I can't really remember myself ever being funny. I mean, the reason I got into comedy, for example, well, I, I, I sold, got, got divorced and I sold my business, and and I was just knocking about doing nothing, really. And my mate of mine said that you're just sitting around getting pissed every day. Come and work for me. And he said, I... I think you're quite funny, Griff. Go on a course. So I went on that Amuse Moose course. With, and you, well, they can't yeah. teach you how to be funny, but you, you meet like-minded yeah. people. Yeah. And Logan Murray is just a star, mate. I mean, and I've, I, I feel classy was a friend to this day, even though I don't see him very often. You know, you, you meet loads of people doing that sort of stuff. Just to get back, though, so at school, was you, was you trouble at school or was you mystery? No, was not, you not, getting told off? Was you... Well, not, not really. I mean, I, there, there was always fights, but kids of our age have fights. No, not really. No, we, me and a, group, a tight group of friends that I met um, okay. Hello. So you, met a tight, you met a tight group of friends and Hello, you all John. got on. You all stayed together. You just mute you just muted your phone. Hello, mate. John. <laughs> you just, okay, well, um the gremlin that we always have uh seems to have just hit us for a second. Griff just popped off. But he's actually quite a lively character. Pete, if you've got any great stories about him, James, do let us know. Um, the thing with Griff is that he's just full of mischief. He's he's pressed the button on his on his phone. He's not um, really tech savvy. So hopefully we'll get him back in a little while. It's always interesting to me, though, to see how people were as kids and how they fitted into their family and how they were at school. So I'm, you know, from a, a big, a big Irish family as I've mentioned a few times in the past. I was always um, lively, I think is the word. I was very shy as a kid, uh, crippling shyness I had when I was very, very young. But then as I got older, I kind of overcame it. Um, and I learned to watch. I was always watching people. And where I grew up, it was such a vibrant sort of energetic place that uh, there was loads and loads of characters around. So I used to kind of mimic, watch, and take notice of people. And then what happened then was I just became such a good mimic that I could make people laugh. I certainly soon realized that there was power in laughter and that by making people laugh, you know, they was generally um, receptive. It was a kind of friendlier way of being and it kind of oiled. It was a social lubricant, I guess that's what it was. Um, at school, like most comics, I was disruptive. I think they could be maladjusted at one stage. I don't know what that was all about, but... Um, you know, it didn't stick as a label. So I was very, very academic, though, but the school I went to wasn't geared towards academia. So again, like most comedians, I found myself just making trouble, but being very, very bright. And that didn't really help me. But the school I went to didn't care anyway, because they were more interested in, you know, it was a very trendy kind of what you now called a loony lefty one, um, where they, uh, we didn't do history and geography, for example, we did humanities, so where other schools were doing stuff about the war, we didn't do any of that. We would do like the weather on D-Day and what the geography of the place was. So it was very progressive, I guess, but didn't really help when it came to doing GCSEs and A-levels because it meant that we didn't quite understand the mechanism for learning. What about you guys that are listening? Anyone out there have a similar experience, a good experience, bad experience of school? Is it just comics? and creatives that are kind of, I guess, cursed by this uh, labelling and uh, the same behaviours that we all have. Because whenever we meet up in green rooms or on car journeys, we invariably the conversation comes around to what would you like as a kid? And very few of us had uh, formal or conventional paths that we walked. But, you know, it comes in handy because years later, we're able to... Um, go on stage in front of a room full of strangers and just be show-offs, basically, because that's all comedy is. It's just about being confident and being a show-off. I'm hoping that he's back. Are you back, mate? Sorry, John. Can you hear me now? I can hear you fine. You just pressed the button and then you disappeared. I thought you'd been No, kidnapped. no, no. What happened was uh, someone said, um, you're on my phone. You know, I said that I can't work my computer because I'm yeah. really technically using so use this. I told you someone rings. We're in trouble. 
Yes, so, somewhere rung and we was in trouble. <laughs> was it so, PPI? It was, my, it was my mate Sibo, would you believe? Because he's trying to probably find out whether... Anyway, oh, so where mate. were we? No, you missed it all, mate. I've told, I've filled them all in there. Know all about you now. I don't need you. I've told them the story. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so you left school. What did you do when you left school? What was your first job? Well, I was uh, I was playing drums. I think I had my first record out when I was at school. So I was already a musician. Um, but I um, I started working for my dad. He sold second-hand cars and tires. But I, then we had uh, market stores. I opened up some market stores. I had a market store at Camden, uh, Greenwich, uh, Portobello Road. We did sold second-hand clothes. Second-hand clothes. Okay. So we buy like a suit for 10p from a jumble sale and sell it yeah. for 40 quid. And for three years, two and a half, three years, we, we it was just brilliant fun, mate. And then I had to, we, we used to sell sort of product of Doubtful Origin over at Greenwich. And product and of Doubtful Origin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. Yes, so, uh, but, but whilst that was going, I was still drumming. Uh, you know, so uh, the, the drumming has always been my passion. You know, I've made loads of records, one thing led to another, sort of went, then eventually got signed to quite a big major record deal. And I was professional. How did you get spotted to get the record deal? Well, it, it's so good. when you're in the music industry, it's like you, you sort of progress through different bands. There's like apprenticeships, and some people drop to the wayside from each band. So if you've got four okay. players, three of them would, would disappear, and that one would carry on going. And I was that one from my particular band that carried on going. Um, and after, I, I don't know, I think I had about 10 or 12 releases out, all of which was, uh, had a certain degree of success. And then uh, I was in a band called The Fun Crew, and we, we, we thought we were brilliant. We had a manager called Alan Bowne, who was quite a big star in the 60s. He was a friend of a friend of everybody. And it, it, we just decided we couldn't get arrested the, for a record deal. But we, we, we decided to put a record out ourselves. So we put the record out ourselves, which cost us you know, skin us all. Uh, but we got a listed Radio 1. And all of a sudden, we had Arista, EMI, uh, I think Warner Brothers, all trying to sign us. So it, it was a long process, John. It, it wasn't like an overnight success. You know, I think every band that you ever hear about, unless you've come off of um, one of those shows like... Uh, uh, you know, make me a star show. Yeah, but yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 there's never an overnight success. You know, like everybody has worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. But yeah, so that's 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 my my, my, my drumming career. But I've, I've made loads of records about being on TV and so, I was. Uh, let's, go, let's go back a minute before you get too carried away. So, yeah. what the band was the big one? Strength or what was the? Well, strength. Yeah, we. I think we we only got to number thirty eight in the British charts. Oh. Uh, but we were signed to a big a big American label. Um, yeah, I, you know, I wasn't really a famous drummer, but you know, I was quite well, well respected. Yeah, I've done a lot of sessions. I toured with uh, Dollar Odyssey, um, the Cool Notes, um, Edwin cool. Star. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I've, I've done, I've done my fair share, but and I was sponsored by Tama, which is an American drum company. So, if, if I was ever on the TV or uh, uh, an interview, I mentioned Tama, I get all this stuff sent to me for free. But one thing led to another, the band split up. Um, and they, they formed a band called Dry as a Bone. And I, as soon as that happened, I sort of left. Uh, and then I started my furniture company. And I hadn't played, didn't play drums then for like 30, 30 odd years, I don't think, 25 years. Wow. Is, is then, it, so, is it... so, how did it work then? You, so, you, was it just two of you in strength, or how many was there? Well, we had a whole band, uh, but there was just myself and Billy. Um, and there, there, there was, we, had that, we had a whole band to start with, but it's. We, it was like, um, I think we were mismanaged, really, not by my, because my old man was part of the management team, but somebody else. And he sort of took us to this direction where it was like, make you into these little, like, little pop starlets. You know, you see me with the long hair and I was in smash hits and my guy in blue jeans and um, number one spread of uh, num a blue jeans magazine and me showing muscles. It was, they tried to put us down that route and we were more of, I, I was more of a rock drummer. I kind I've of got, went with that. Just I've got to be honest, Griff, when I saw the, um, when you sent me the music, oh, I was a few years back now. I um, it wasn't what I was expecting at all, and it was this kind of very kind of boy band, mischievous. I expected it. I thought you'd be like a heavy rocker. Or, well, know, we've done. We, we, I, I did some punk stuff, uh, but the, yeah, I, I mean, I, it didn't really suit me to really be honest with you, John. You know, I, was, that, I used to have girls. I had a flat around the corner, which we I bought with the, the advance with the record company. Uh, and girls come and knocking on my door, like little girls. And we had a fan club, and I had to go to these different signings. It wasn't really me. I mean, I went with it. You know, I had long blonde hair, and I, I was. I did, even though I sat myself, 
I thought I was quite good looking. But, you know, if I could take a pill now, John, to get that hair back, I wouldn't have it. Yeah. You know, because I would just look like some kind of divine, you know. It, it you, look... Work. <laughs> you look like Peter Stringfellow, mate, got the teeth. Oh, you God, like. yeah. Shaving my head was the best thing I ever did, mate. I love it. I love it. Brilliant, brilliant. And then, so, okay, so the band doesn't play out. The, the pop stardom hasn't really worked. What did you do next? Well, no, no, it, it worked, and I was professional, but... I got to a certain level, and I, I think if I'd have carried on going, I probably wouldn't have been about because I was certainly Mr. Excess in those days. You know, I, I was a bit of a party animal, I must admit. But uh, when, when I got out of the music industry, my dad, my, my granddad, was his hobby was gilding and, and, and uh, restoration on old, uh, antique frames and stuff, like gesso plaster work, but very traditional. And his hobby, he taught my dad that hobby, and I used to help my dad just restoring frames as a pastime and one thing yeah. led to another i thought well i'll do that so i started making a few frames put them in, a, in an old van that i had I used to take them around different shops and one thing led to another 12 years later i had uh i think 14 staff uh it was two salesmen one for the north of england one for the south of england i was winning awards for my designs um yeah so i was doing i was doing very well yeah and i sold well, it when i was 38. so what happened then well I, I, for whatever reason, myself and my wife, we run out of gas for whatever reason. Yeah. And I had a bit of a breakdown. And I had a big showroom. Now, in this showroom, there's a lot in between, John. But in this showroom, I used to sell furniture. Some of the pictures on the walls I would paint, but, some of, but it was furniture. And I had this almost a throne. And for some reason, mate, I, I don't know how it happened coming about. I told somebody I was the king of Spain, right? And they said, I said, don't bother buying that, mate. You can take it. So they just took this bit of item off the wall and it went round to my parade of shops within an hour. And rather than saying, look, you've got a problem here, Griff, you should close the shop door because you're giving things away. Some, this isn't right. They were telling their friends to come in and take stuff off me. But I was sitting on this throne believing I was the king of Spain and I gave all loads of stuff away. And I, I, I know, I know, I, I peed in the sun, John, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and I ended up, uh, I drove down to, to Bristol because I was so confused. And I was going to kill myself. I was going to jump off the suspension bridge. I know it sounds, it sounds ridiculous even saying it now. And the tide was out. And I didn't want to go to the afterlife covered in shit. And it got really on my life. And my brother lived about 20 miles away. One thing led to another. I ended up going to the Priory for about three months because I had private health insurance. And there I was in the Priory thinking I was the king of Spain. My mum and dad coming in crying. And it was just, it was a bit, you, bit bizarre, mate. Okay. But you're comfortable to tell us about this, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so when yes, you, yeah, absolutely. When you went on that drive down there, what was your intention to just end it all? To be honest with you, John, I don't think it was, mate. No, I mean, if, if if I wanted to end it, I wouldn't have driven somewhere so close to my little brother who I love. You know, you know, like, but it, it was certainly a very confusing part of my life. So I'm in the Priory, and you know, that place. It was good for, for, for me at the time, but they were trying to, they, first of all, they tested me for drugs and alcohol, there was none there, which means there's a chemical imbalance. So I, I, I prescribed drugs, blah, 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 blah. You know, the people next door to me, the, she thought she was married to George Michael. Somebody else thought that he was, uh, I, I don't know, the best friend of the Pope. Was, was, everyone had their own issues there. Uh, but when I came out of there, I decided to put that, which was just a bizarre thing, into a positive, not because I'm some kind of genius, but because I just thought, where, where did that come from? I might as well use this to my advantage. And I became the comedian. A part of my act was I was the king of Spain. Yeah, yeah. That's, but, I get that. So but in the build-up to giving the stuff away, when you look back now, can you see how it started going off the rails? Yes, or, or... I can, yes. Because I was working and working and working. and well, I never had any time off. I was working through the night. You know, I had a nice BMW convertible. And I drove past the pub some nights on a Tuesday or a Thursday at 10 o'clock. And my mates would be in there. But I was just working. I'd have dinner parties when I never turned up because I was always working. And it just it just blew my mind. I think that put a wedge between me and my wife. It, you know, it, yeah, it, it was just the strength that, to know, the, 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 uh, the, the will to want to achieve, I think. But it just took me the wrong direction. You know, and I certainly wasn't happy, but I just had to do it. It, it was just there. I had to do it. But you had, so you had money. You got the car, yes. you got the trappings of a good life. Yes. But you still weren't happy. No, it wasn't happy at all, mate. No, it wasn't happy at all. But I don't know because, like, when when I when I sold the business, I had a few bob, and uh, my little brother, who was a mortgage advisor, he said, "What are you going to do?" And I said, "Well, I don't know, because I'm no big stakes to the business." 
So he suggested to buy some properties over in the east end of London. So I think I bought about eight. He bought two. I bought a, a, um, a villa in um, in uh, in uh, where was it? Is in in Cyprus. Uh, but then we got the Olympic bid. So these eight or nine properties I had, they pretty much quadrupled in price overnight. So uh, how it happened, it just happened. Uh, and he said, right, now you can build in the portfolio. I said, no, no, I'm going to have I, I sold, I'm going to have 20 years off. So I sold a lot and I just had all that time to myself. Now, if I hadn't have done that, I don't think I would have survived. It's, it's a bit crass now looking back because I think, oh, I wish I had all that. But if I hadn't have t- chosen that route, I don't think I would have been here because that kept me alive. You know, just I, I think I had 27 or 28 holidays in one year, John, you know, wow. flying lessons, handmade suits, you know, learning to sail, brand, you know, you know do you it, think it you kept was, me alive. Were you still in trouble, though, mentally at that time, do you think? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I still have issues now. No, if, if I keep myself busy, John, I have to be kept busy. That's probably why I've achieved so much or done so much in my life. Because yeah. if, I, if I stay still for too long, I analyse what, 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 what I'm doing, really. So I have to keep myself busy. You know, like just with my dog, I have to get up at half past five, six o'clock to take her for a walk. Otherwise, I get grief off my dog. But you have, I have, this is my own way of getting through it. Yeah. I yeah, have yeah. to keep busy. I have to, I have to keep active and keep busy. So how did the comedy start? Then? What made you, you? Someone just said you're funny. Do a course. You went on Logan's course. Yes, yeah, yeah. I was. Well, I, I didn't need the money. And it was a good friend of mine called Andy Nichols. He's still. He's one of my oldest friends from school. And he's still one of my best friends today. He said he didn't really need me. He didn't really have a role for me in his firm. I wasn't a builder. I think the first job I did, I remember, uh, he said, "Take some tiles off this wall." And he left. <laughs> and I took all these tiles off the wall, and I came across the pipe for the uh, sink, and I didn't know. I just pulled it to one side. You know, and it just, yes, and it was pouring. Anyway, but he, Nichols didn't really need, he didn't need me, but he was paying me because he could see that I was in a very destructive place, That's sitting nice. on my own, getting pissed, not doing anything. So he got me out and about. But he said, go on a comedy course, Griff. Like, I never even thought about it. So I joined the comedy course with Logan Murray with, with about 12 like-minded people over at uh, the Amuse Moose. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, sort of two years later, three years later, I'm, I'm headlining shows, which I've done three, I've been it three for three years in a row. I think the first one I was up there was, was the Amused Moose. And then I was up there because I was in the, the Hackney Empire final. So it was the best of the Hackney Empire. And what then year me was that? Do you remember that? Was that 2004? Yeah, well, you were there because I remember, you, I, I found yeah. that flyer, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. 2002, 2003? Yeah. Uh, I think Andrew Lawrence was in the Amused Moose final with me. That's how long ago it was. Wow. Uh, and I'd done a show with Nigel Taylor, the King and I, but I was just hating it. I was missing my girlfriend at the time. I was missing my son. You know, it, it was. It, I was falling out of love of comedy. And it was two weeks into the show. Now this is an honest, honest story. I thought, well, I'm going to have a tattoo done. So I went to a tattoo shop in Edinburgh to have be happy. And it, I said, be happy, please, mate. And he put the the wire the wrong way round. Now if there was anything that was going to swing me whether to stay in Edinburgh or not, was the fact that a dyslexic Scottish tattoo <laughs> mis- mis- yeah, he put the fucking wire the wrong way around. So I just thought, well, that's it, you know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I said to Nigel, who's a lovely fellow, I said, look, Nigel, it's called the King and I, our show, but this is killing me, I've got to go home. So that was it. I, I left, and my last ever gig was a Laughing Horse gig. I was headlining over at uh, somewhere in Richmond, and all I did, because I was never, I never bullied or abused the audience. I had my stories. You know my, my routine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I was just telling everybody how much I hated them, and funny enough, they, they loved it. And I could have gone on to do more more shows down that route, just basically abusing the audience. But my love of comedy left, and you know what it's like? It's, it's all encompassing comedy, isn't it? it? It takes over. You have to be in there. It, 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 well, certainly for me, you have to think it. You're you're in it. You're trying to gig. You're out every night. It takes over your whole life, doesn't it? It does for a lot of people. You got to keep yourself in check. So. I did um, a cruise. I got back last Saturday, and this Saturday I'll go on another one. So the two weeks in between, I've done a one a one hour presentation last week, and I'll do a one hour presentation this week. That's it. I won't take any more gigs. I won't take any more work because I tr- I've always tried to have that balance. I try and take off one week yeah, well, that, a you, month. That's twenty years have gone by since you know <laughs> when you first started, John. Yeah, but he, but that's the thing. That's why I never really. I remember in two thousand, I think it was two thousand one. The Evening Standard did. Uh, they got ten acts doing ten minutes each, and uh, they said these are you know the up and coming acts on the London comedy circuit. 
And they did a review and they said, you know, the guys to watch, Russell Brand, Steve Merchant, John Ryan. And they interviewed the three of us. And yep. they said, Russell, what are you going to do? He said he's going to do stadiums and blah, blah, blah. Steve said he's going to write sitcoms. And, and I said, I just want to be happy and have healthy kids. And the guy that did the article just laughed at me. Then he'd done a follow-up about 15 years later. And I said, um, he said, the other two have achieved what they set out to do. Do you feel resentful? I said, no, I've set out what I've achieved to do. And Steve Merchant at that stage still wasn't in a relationship. And Russell was, you know, all over the place. He had all yeah, kinds yeah, of yeah. problems. So it's yeah. about be careful what you wish for. Be careful what, what you want. It's, I, I listened to your show last week with... Um, James Dazwell. Yeah, it, James Dazwell. Yes. Yeah, James Dowsworth, and he was saying the same thing. You know, you have to kind of know where you are. But it's, yeah, it's just, it depends. Yeah, it's very much um, what, watch out what you, you wish for, isn't it, really? Yeah, watch out for what you wish for. At this stage, I just want to um, give a little shout out to uh, our sponsors, WJ Group, who are the UK's leading road marking specialists. They've been very, very supportive of the show and of mental well being in, in the broad community in general. So, so thanks for that. Um, anyone just listening now, this is Griff Griffiths uh, in my head. Yeah, mate, I could spend days listening to you and your book. It's just the way you kind of matter. That's why I say, like my mates, it's just that matter of fact way you'll tell a story that most people would be petrified of. But you'd go, OK, so, for example, when I was younger, one of my mates, he went on holiday to Bulgaria and he realised that there's a lot of British tourists out there. And with the resort he stayed in, the nightclub was three miles away. And all the taxis would charge ridiculous money. People were getting attacked in it. So he saw this business opportunity for me and him and my cousin to get a double-decker bus out there and right. take tourists from the resort to the nightclub. Okay? So basically, we ended up – he acquired – um, a double decker bus, uh, which believe it or not, you would have thought it, it had doubt, doubtful origin. You would have thought you'd get pulled <laughs> over as soon as how'd you, how'd you nick a bus? How'd you nick a bus, mate? He, Make Cliff he Richard, got, are you? No, but we got down as far as Canterbury before, um, just the panic got too much. But it hadn't occurred to him what he was gonna, he carried on in it and uh, he got caught further on. Um, he kicked us out, told us that we were a pair of somethings. Um, and he and and even if you fly out there, you know, I'm not splitting the money with you. And then he then p tried to get this double decker bus onto a boat that was his plan, but he got pulled over because he went on the motorway. Um, but that's well, kind of you could, you could have thought that through a bit better, mate. Couldn't you? He didn't, yeah, never, he was never one for thinking. But do you Talking know, so about... when, when I read your stories and you hear your stories, I'm like, yeah, I can see that. Well, because they, 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 I wanted it to be. True. So they're all true, first of all. I wanted it to be like you pick it up. I think was the, one of the opening pages is something like, uh, I want this book, book to be like an, uh, a beautiful swimming pool in the sun. You can dive yeah. into it whenever you want. In yes, that's, I remember when I spoke to you about it, you said, oh, some of those stories could be, you can make them longer if you like. Rick. Yeah. I remember you gave me some suggestions. But I, want, yeah, yeah. I like the idea with some, one of them's one line and some of them aren't. I just... But I, even when I pick it up myself, I think to myself, God, God, it sounds like I'm making it out, but I'm not. It's, no, it's no, I know. No, no. And it's just that kind of matter of factness that you um, you just drop into conversation. I remember a mate of mine, he went out one night and he got absolutely uh, paralytic and was convinced that he'd um, spent the night with Robbie Williams, the singer from Take That. Right. And then, right. But, you know, obviously we're all going to know you're a liar. And then when, when we checked it out, it, it was true. It was actually true. And But it, it's just like they he, he, he took – Robbie Williams was going for a tough time at the time, by all accounts. And um, they was going to go pictures, but he didn't really want to watch a film. So in the end, they went um, up a street in Islington. There used to be an arcade. Went in and played on the arcades and then bought him a KFC, put him on a bus, said, nice to meet you. And that was the story. And you go, that's just that's just wonderful in itself, isn't it? Oh, well, it's just, I had a fight with Rick Astley, right? <laughs> and we don't... <laughs> now, is it, it's, I, I know. The, 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 remember, is... the, remember that remember black box? Right on time. Yeah, yeah. When, yeah, when yeah. I was coming down the stairs, and they were going up, and she pulled my hair and went ding dong, and I turned around, and it's, Rick Astley's down there. So I thought, because my dad was with me as well, as a few other right. people. So I thought, I kind of not hit him, but, and he... 
thinking that he would just go, oh, sorry, mate. And he fucking went for me. So we're pu- having a tumble, to roll down upstairs, and it was split up by members of Aswad, right? Brilliant. And you can't fucking write, yeah. you can't write that. Brilliant. Anyway, Brilliant. about four years ago, I was with my wife, and she said, Rick Astley's on the radio, he had his own radio show. She said, phone him up and ask him if he remembers. Now, to me, that's a big story. But yeah. he might get put up here, he might have a fight every week, I've got no yeah. idea. But I couldn't yeah. handle the... Uh, um, I wouldn't. What's the word I'm looking for? I couldn't handle the, the rejection if he said no, mate. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, you know, because to me, it's it's really important part of my little world. But to him, it's just another ball but fell out in the fight. <laughs> but yeah, he could have it. Rick was like, Rick, Rick was going to have Rick, it. Rick, he can have it. I tell you what. Yes, yeah, so he was never going to give you up. I know you're going to say it. Go on, mate. Go on. Yeah, yeah go on. Mate. Yeah, yeah. I'd fight Rick. But all of these things are in the book that I met. Yeah, just loads of stuff. I mean, it's, it's, what's your favourite? What's your favourite story um, from the book? Uh, oh, it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't involve um, any uh, any celebrities. But I went. A mate of mine's really into metal detecting. Right. And he goes all over the country, up and down. So he said, "Come on, we'll go metal detecting." So me and my mate Eric and another mate of ours called the carpet. We went metal detecting. He, he picks me up from here, and we go to some field in Norwich. At like half past two in the morning, three o'clock, we get this field, and you have to pay to go on. There's a tent, uh, from like a history, you know, like full of historians. So, if you find yep. anything of historical interest, you give it to the tent people, and then they look at it and say, Oh, because it may be a field of historical interest, you know, it, it, it may be something very interesting. Anyway, and he, he, four hours later, I found nothing, I like a pre sun packet in a biro, and he says, Quick, quick, come here, come here. I said, What you got? and he showed me this round thing, right like a brass and he said i said what is it he said it's the boss of a saxon shield you know the middle bit uh-huh. of a saxon shield that, that that would have been worth a fortune it would have probably changed his life and he said he's not going to give it in and i said it looks a bit too engineered there he said no 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 but he didn't give it in it turned out he went home cleaned it all up weighed it took pictures of it, it turned out to be the petrol cap of a tractor <laughs> anyway, that right. makes, it right. makes me laugh. Joe. It didn't make you laugh. It made me laugh. No, that's brilliant. That's, that's, a lovely that's story. one of my favourite stories. So, uh, John Newton. I'm sure you remember John Newton. He's of course just, I do. Yes. Yeah, he's just uh, asking where the Dalek is. He's, oh, the Dalek's um... upstairs in my bedroom, John. He, he, we 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 done a gig. <laughs> we done a gig somewhere or other, and I think he dro- he dropped me home, and he then because it was so late. I think it was me, Henning, John, and Coppin, Nick Coppin. Yeah. Uh, he dropped me home here, and I, gave, I, I bought him a little tiny Dalek. I remember, do you remember that, John? If he's still listening, some He's of those people, from, the, the people from those days, uh, Mr. Ryan, are just. I mean, sometimes I don't speak to them from one year to the next, but they're just still very good friends of mine. I spoke to Gareth Berlino the other day because I wanted to tell him that I was on your show, yeah, yeah. and I hadn't spoken to him for six years. And unfortunately, he was he was in hospital because he's been poorly with all these issues. Yeah, yeah. Got. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, but you know, but it's, it's like us. You know, I, I spoke to him only yesterday, you know, some it, it, brilliant people, David Ward, all, all those boys. So yeah, my favourite, my favourite story. Joe Wilkinson, I still speak to him a lot. Henny, I spoke to him yesterday, yesterday. I love the story. It's the silly things like the dog getting chased by the ice cream. Oh, um, mate, that was a real story. And it, so shall I tell it quickly? Go on, tell us how it happened, go on. Right, so I'm sitting at the traffic lights in Wallet and I think I was the first car on the lights and... So this dog runs across in front of me, attached to a Walls ice cream sign. So and he's just run across, cars are stopping, he's run into a wall and knocked himself out. So I've jumped out because you know the dog. And the fellas come running across. I said, Well, oh, what's happening, mate? He said, Oh, I went to get myself something in the shop and I tied him to the sign and he thinks he's being chased by it. I said, Oh, no harm done, that's the end of the story. Two days later, I'm having an operation on my knee. And I'm sitting in the in, literally about to be put under the anesthetic, and the fella comes and says, No. It, it was the, the the fellow whose dog it was. It was the anest, an, anesthetist. He said, "Oh, my my, my dog was you to save my dog." And I said, "Oh yeah." And, and, and anyway, it's not a funny story, but that's a story. it's very funny. So all these kind of little manic little episodes, all these little great little tales and stories you have, right? Do you not see though that that part of your creativity comes from this chaos? Yes. So when you said. Uh, I think that the the, the the advert or the, what to get people interested for tonight it was like an, uh, it said uh, an honest insight into a creative mind. And I thought bloody hell, no pressure there. But yes, yeah, certainly, it's like I pa- I paint pictures, but sometimes John, I, I I won't paint for three months, and then I'll get up one night, bang, and I'll paint six in four hours, and then there's nothing. 
it, 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 it's almost like there's something else in me. And it, it's, it's not a godlike um, thing, but it's like it's, it's, I have to create and I will paint eight or nine pictures and then I just won't even pick up the brush for another year. And sometimes I will look at this stuff that I've painted and I wonder how I've done it because it's not even me that's done it. See, if that makes sense. Yeah, a, a, a mate of mine, a little name drop, Lucy Freud, right? She's a, she's an artist, fantastic. I was talking to her about this because I can't I can't draw. When I was at school, when it was art class, um, we had a, an arrangement me and the teacher whereby I could just write stories and I wouldn't have to draw, and then and then we were happy. I talked about it to my daughter today. My daughter is a fantastic artist, um, and me and my son, he can draw cereal boxes. He says so, but she's got the family gene for for painting. Anyway, talking to Lucy, who is a professional artist, she was saying that she has these easels set up and she can walk past them for weeks at a time and just not look at them. But then the day yeah. it catches her, she will, she'll stay there 20 hours. Yes, it's exactly the same with me. Exactly the same. I end up taking over the whole house. I'm not almost painting two at the same time. And then it would be nothing. I could paint like seven or eight and it'd be nothing. But see that mania, that frenzy, that's got to be tiring. Uh, it is, yeah, it is, well, yeah, 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 I suppose so, I suppose so, yeah, <laughs> I don't really know. But then, um, how do you, you've got to have an It's nervous energy, it. most of the time, nervous, it's nervous energy. energy, I suppose. But, you know, you're, like, you're a big lad, you can handle yourself, and I always remember meeting you, uh, and realising that there was no, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but the world is your stage, it's not like you go on, switch it on, come off, switch it off again, you're as entertaining in the car as you are on stage. Well, funny enough, people do say that. I mean, women, when I go out, we, we do have a laugh, but I've got most of my friends are very entertaining. You know, it's like when you go out with lots of comedians, strangely enough, they're nice people and they're great company, but they're not entertaining. No, do you know no. what I mean? If, 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 oh, a, if, like, if, if a civilian, like, as you yeah. call them, John, joins yeah. a, a group of comedians, like there's Henning, Joe Wilkerson, me, yeah, Greg yeah. Davis, you, they'd be expecting it to be, hey, whoa, hey. And it yeah. isn't, is it? Yeah. It isn't, is it? I we just. I'm, I'm, people are often um, um, amazed at how dull I am, and then, <laughs> so I'm quite happy. And, and and honestly, you'll get conversations. Me and Tashby actually, get, and and a mate or whatever, a friend of hers will say, and, and you're the comedian. I'll say, well, it's, yeah, one of the things I do, but it's not what I am. Well, they, you know? yeah, but but, you, that, but I think, I think your, your beauty is, John. You're, you are you. You come across very natural. Like you said, on fair. You said you're nosy. You are genuinely yeah, want to know what's nosy. going on behind yeah. it. You are genuinely yeah, nosy. But it comes across without being nosy. It comes across as if you're, you're interested in, in the character. You're interested. I mean, I think the first time I met you, you was you would. Uh, it was so you think you're funny competition uh, down in was Reading that, or somewhere or other. Uh, was I hosting it? Yeah, that's yes, right, I was yes, yes. Imran, Imran, Imran should have won it. Yes, brilliant comedian. Oh, you should have won it. You, it was your. You should have won it. Yes, I know that, mate. I know that. Oh, mate. I remember telling you that at the end. I remember saying to you, "You should. You're not going to win it, mate, but you should." Well, the strange thing is, people would say that when I did the Amuse Moose. Now, I remember Rod Gilbert, who was a friend of mine, but he came up to me because he was at the Amuse Moose final. And he said, "You won that," but yeah. it's, it, I think it's politics because I was. I'm fifteen. I'm fifty nine this year, so I was at least twelve, fifteen years older than yeah. most of the people that are on the stage. It's politics involved. Um, here yeah. was Jago, you know whatever i mean i like her she's a bit crazy but she came backstage with two pints of lager and there was me and a few others a fellow called stuart hudson who's no longer with us unfortunately but he was yeah. he was backstage because he was part of the final and she gave a pint of lager to uh, andrew lawrence and a pint of lager to the person who came second we all went oh she said no 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 it's just them two so we knew that they were going to come first and second but you know it, it is what it is you know, I was too old, maybe I swore too much. I remember she said to me, you're getting well known on the circuit for busting busting a microphone stand. So I used to bang them on the floor. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I just yeah. went and bought my own. It cost me 140 quid, so I used to take it to the kids. And she Brilliant. said, look, can we borrow your one? It's better than our one. It's just, you know. <laughs> but so, but this is my thing, right? So going back, my mania is very controlled. So I can remember the corridor that I spoke to you in in Newbury at that um, New Act final. And I remember the fact that Imran won it. And I remember talking to you and you were all hyped up. And I said, mate, well done. You, you're not going to win. You, you're the best act. You should have won it. And even Imran, who won it, said he should have won it. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, but yeah. I remember, I can remember the smell of the corridor and the corridor. And it's not because in any way, you know, that that was a, a, a standout night in my life. But it's just that 
I associate the image, the conversation, the clothes as well. So if ever I'm having a disagreement with someone, I will say, look at me, look at what I'm wearing, look around the room, take a smell and listen, and never forget this moment. And when I was young, then I well, did. But now I just kind of, <laughs> now, now I just walk away. Today? Wait, I don't know if you remember my act, but I was quite full on. Oh, I, yeah. I was, you know, it was, I put a lot into it. I mean, I've been, I've been in Edinburgh, I think the first time I was up there, you're doing like six shows a day, aren't you? You do a yeah. gig here, a gig there, a gig here. You know, it's, it's our graft on, isn't it? You know, and like, so there'll be another actor on who's, I, I don't know, like Henning, he's so low key compared to mine. Yeah. You know, but the, the two t- completely different acts. But yeah. yes, I was yeah. always, uh, but that's how I am a bit anyway. But that's how you are in life, isn't it? That's how you are. Yes, so, I how did you so, cope yeah. with lockdown then when we couldn't get out and we couldn't, um, you know, we couldn't do much? Well, yeah, I, I think lockdown was fun because I got my dog. I was just taking my dog out. And obviously, I was looking after my mum and dad, you know, because they've looked after me my whole life. I was looking after them too. Funny enough, John, it came to the end of lockdown and I went out and I bought them a cup. So, well, two mum and dad, you know, awarded it to them. And I said, this is from me. Thank you for putting up with me, blah, 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 for the last 18 months. And they'd been out to a different uh, cup place and bought a medal for me, saying thank you for putting up with them. <laughs> How lovely is that? So we had an yeah. awesome award ceremony here on the stairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, lockdown was difficult, you know. But about four weeks ago, I had COVID. Um, I had it, it wasn't too bad for me actually. I, to be honest with you, I wouldn't mind every other weekend because I sat in my TV room. I phoned up my mum and said, oh, "Can you leave us some donuts outside?" And then she'd knock on the door. There'd be donuts and cups of tea. And... <laughs> can you leave me some donuts? Yeah, I know. I'm fifty. I'm, I'm fifty-eight, mate. What's going on? But how do you cope my... then with the isolation and not being able then with COVID? What? You must have been getting out of your head. Yeah, it, it was it was hard. It was hard. Yeah, yeah. It was a couple of personal items that happened, but, but you know, in my in my personal life, which I could arguably resolved now, and that was as a direct result of lockdown. You know, and I think a lot of a lot of people were struggling with that, weren't they? You know, because it was it was hard work for everybody, wasn't it? It was hard work. I mean, some people loved it, some people didn't. Yeah. Some people were still working from home. You know, like like I, was, I think I mentioned you off air. A very good friend of mine called Kim Ross. Uh, maybe he's listening tonight, but he, he, he suffers a bit. And he just recently he's had like a, a month and a half in bed. You know, things really get to him because he runs his own business very successfully. But he, you can't switch off, you know. And then, so when I, I when know. you then when you look at it and you think about when you was at your lowest point, what did you need? What could people have done that could have maybe helped you? Would you have well, when I was re- really bad? Yeah. What could what would have helped you? Nothing. No, nothing really. I mean, I I knew that all. I've got some very, very, very lifelong loyal friends. Some of which I've known for like since I was eight or nine. In fact, most of which I've, there's a big group of them, maybe a fifty, sixty of us. So we're all very, very tight. Um, there's nothing. It's, you can't really put your hand on someone and say, "Oh, don't worry, mate. Cheer up. Tomorrow, tomorrow's another day." It doesn't work that way. Well, it's certainly not for me. And for the people that yeah. I know that suffer from, with some kind of depression or bipolar, it doesn't work that way for them either. You know, we all we all suffer like everybody does. With you know, if you're upset about you've had a row with your missus, or you feel that you're having a bad hair day, or you, you know, you, there's bits on the TV that you're not agreeing with. We all suffer with those kind of upset. But the, this, when you're really down, it's it's in a trough you cannot get out of. Mate, like, I would be very happy. I haven't done it for five years. I would sit in my room for three weeks, mate. Right? I wouldn't talk to anybody. And even if a friend came round, which they often did, I wouldn't want them in the house. Like, when I was in the priory, I had so many people come down to see me. I didn't want to see them. There's nothing they could do. I, but I knew they were there, and I would be there for them, but there's nothing they can do. But did that help, knowing that they were there, or is it just something you went through on your own? It's something, I was, well, this is from my own personal point of view, John, it's something that I went through on my own. I knew that they were there, but I had to do it, you know. One thing I didn't want to do was come out of the prior with loads and loads of drugs. So I, I managed to keep myself fit. I mean, there was, I had to in the end, because of the, I had a chemical imbalance. But... Uh, I didn't want to you know, sort of take one of these to get through it, take this, because I think that you're coming out of there with another issue. And I went in there with an issue of not taking drugs, so why come out with one? That's the way I saw it. No, but I, I know so. now, I it's taken me for many, many years, John, I'm 59 in May, All I, I just have to keep busy. I have to keep busy. I mean, the start of this year, I've got this documentary and the uh, the book and some other bits and pieces. I'm busy. And that's, that's keeping me, don't, 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 I'm moving in the right direction. But if I didn't have that, you know, I wouldn't go and get a job. I wouldn't be that. You know, nothing's that bad. <laughs> 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 but, 
if you had to but give yeah, someone to a tip, you have to give someone a bit of advice, right? And say to them, look, this is what this is what might help you with your with your head, with your well being. Can you think of one thing maybe that you'd suggest or recommend? Well, it, this isn't scientific, but right, get okay. a dog, go out walking. Get a dog. Well, I, I know some people don't like dogs, but how can you not like know, dogs? Some people don't, do they? Some people oh, don't. Right. I mean, my my Georgie, she's like just the sweetest thing, and I have to take her out every day. She loves going. I know I love going out every day. And it gives you something to get up for, but. Uh, that's not really very good advice, is it, Bart? That's great advice because it's practical and it's real, you know, and it makes a difference. And it, if it, well, like I think you say your dog was saying the same thing, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. You, your dog wakes you up in the morning and gives you a reason to get out of bed, and you've got a structure, you've got responsibility, so that yeah. helps. And you, mate, have been at the rock, rock bottom, okay? And you, have. you, you have right, and so when people go, oh, look, mental well-being, mental health affects people differently. I understand that, but you have kind of accepted and embraced what you've gone through, and you've also seemed to have, you know, you're aware that it's an ongoing battle. Like when we spoke earlier, um, off air, it's like you're not going, I'm going to get cured, I'm going to get helped. You realise this is me, this is what I've got to work with, and I'm going to do the best I can with it. It's taken a long time to get this far, though, John. It's long, a long time to get that into my head. And lots of conversations when you're not depressed with people as well. When, when I've been low, which is very rare nowadays, you can't have a conversation with someone about it. You, you might as well talk to that box, mate. It ain't yeah. going to happen. But yeah. w w when you're out of it, you can see better. Then you can discuss it. But when, like I say, like when my mate Kim Ross, when he was low, I was phoning him. His, his wife would answer the phone. I say, I'll bring anything round. He knows that, but he don't want to see me. He, the last thing he wants is me there. But when he comes out the other side, the first people he phones out were the people yeah. he knows that were there. But yeah. at that point, he, he don't want me. He don't want none of us. But he knows that we're all there and care for him. That's, that's the, that's the so deal. You, you said that working to excess, you think, may have been one of the things that helped tip you over the edge. How are you going to yes. not do that now with the book, with the documentary, with all the other stuff? Well, well first, first of all, I'm, I'm not so hungry for that anymore. You know, I, I'm, I think I'm a different person now. My son's now, he's living in Munich. He hasn't got, there's no finances to go there. I haven't got houses to keep paying for. I've, I, you know, I've just got myself, really. And I think, I, I think I've got a finer balance now. Whereas back then, it was, it was all about material stuff. It was all about... Yeah, you know, nice cars, nice holidays. Want to go skiing three times a year, but that's not what that's not what life's about. Even when I went skiing, I just wanted to sleep or or come back to work. You know, I don't know. I think I've got to find a balance now because I'm getting old, John. That's what it is, mate. You're not getting old, mate. You're going to go. How old are you? How old are you, Mr. Ryan? I'm I'm just shy of fifty-two. Oh, okay. I thought you were younger than that. Yeah, well, you know what it is. It's this useful <laughs> disposition. It's the beard. I can pass with my forties. Or if my cousin Sharon's watching, I'm 77. So, is um, that what she reckons you are? <laughs> actually, we have this running joke that um, I'm older than her, but she's um, she seems to be aging quicker. And it's just a. Now, it's my thing, though, mate. Go. It, it is going that fast. My dad is 86 now. He's one yeah. of my best, my best mate. He comes to so many of those comedy gigs. I mean, I'm sure that everybody, if there's any comedians of shooting tonight, they all know my dad. Uh, he, he always used to say, and still does, Time's too short, it goes too fast, kid. But now, John, Friday, and then bloody hell, it's Friday again. And then bloody hell, it's Friday again. It's these weeks, regardless of how much you put into that and how busy you are and how much you've achieved, those weeks just fly by, mate, yeah, don't they? Just fly, they do. So, when's the book out? When you, when you bring the book out? Well, it's uh, it's coming out hopefully the end of February. I mean, they're still, because it's with a publishing company. I didn't do it myself, but it's with a publishing company. They, they, they just, um, they, it's all. They're getting things right. But it's coming out the end of February. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're doing yes, it all properly. Yes. So what, the, what you do is when, got, when it comes out, send yes. me the link, mate, and I'll obviously um, tat, tat it around for you. Uh, you'll yes, probably have enough for the follow-up book by then, though, let's be honest. <laughs> I don't know if there will be a follow-up book. But I, I've got that documentary coming out as well, which is Are They Hostile? Which is uh, it's the brainchild of myself and a chap called Mark Williams. Uh, and we just had this idea about three years ago when we were watching a film together that's about film about the slits to do a documentary about all the bands that were about when we were younger, the okay. second wave of punk in the, in Croydon. So that's coming out soon. That's been great fun to make. We've got mixed up with some some brilliant bands that are still make them into mine to this day. Uh, so that's coming out soon. I think with a compilation album as well. Uh, and when we have the premiere, John, we, you'll have to come to the uh, to the opening night of the film, mate. Mate, love to, love to. 
I'm going to have to kick you out now, but um, don't uh, disappear too far because I'll speak to you in a few minutes. That hour has just flown by, mate, as it as it always does. I enjoyed that, John. I enjoyed speaking to you, mate. And hopefully I'll speak to you soon. Um, like, mate, stay, I would say stay safe, but I don't mean anything with you. You may tomorrow, your dog may discover <laughs> an unexploded bomb. You, you know, never or... know. I might, I might discover one, mate. <laughs> you take care. Speak soon. So that um, that was a, a very interesting uh, hour that I just spent in the company of Griff. An amazing bloke. When the book comes out, we will um, obviously advertise it. Same with documentary. Uh, like most geniuses he don't do social media so i can't even tell you go and have a look at his twitter or his um instagram accounts because he ain't got them um but he'll probably draw your picture on a bit of paper and send it to you i will post a link to his facebook page on my page as well so do go and check him out and find out what he's up to so what did we learn from that conversation then other than the fact that you know genius comes in um different guises and manifests itself in different ways it seemed to me that he was aware of the fact that he worked to excess. Now, there's a lot of people who could do with working less because, let's be honest, on your deathbed, you are not going to say, I wish I spent more time at work. You will probably say, I wish I had done. And whatever that thing is you wish you had done, please, I urge you, go and start doing it now. You know, make time for yourself. If you're not happy with something, you yeah, know what, don't do it. Just don't do it. Um Understand that there is responsibilities, of course, because sometimes you've got to do things that you don't like. But, you know, that is life. Well-being is all about putting yourself first and trying to somehow reframe unhelpful thoughts. And that's not, I'm not a clinician, I'm not a practitioner, I'm not saying I'm going to cure you, I'm not saying anything of the sort. But what I am saying is, if you're in a good place now, a good way to maintain being a good place is to try and remove negative, toxic people from your life, don't procrastinate. Get a meaningful hobby, like Griff said, you know, get a dog, take the dog for a walk. Dana brilliantly summed it up with companionship, having somewhere, someone there to share your journey. But as Griff pointed out, when you're on that journey, you don't want people. No one can tell you A or B. All you can do is hope that your friends know that you're there, show them that you're there, show them that you care. And when they get better, and people generally do get better, or stabilize in, in a way that means that they can maintain a useful um, and interesting, healthy life. One of the biggest things that people have to understand is that mental health problems happen to more people than you would ever know. Now, Griff's been able to use his well-being situation to be extremely creative, but other people just become extremely destructive. The biggest lesson in life is that don't ever think it can't happen to you. I'm not trying to be preachy and, you know, all kind of gung-ho American and, hey, it's not going to happen to you, man, because it can and it will and it does. And it's a very quick journey from being mentally strong and mentally healthy. If life's events take a hold of you, you can find yourself in a very bad place very, very quickly. One of the things that came across from talking to him was that, um, you know, you've got to learn to know your limitations. Learning to say no is is difficult. But you don't have to go, no, you can say, well, look, I'm not available. Thanks for thinking of me. I can't. Because as he said with his friend who's going through a tough time, sometimes people who are in crisis or on a downward spiral, they're not able to tell you I'm not feeling right. I'm not feeling well or whatever. They are only able to say no. And it comes across as rude. And it, so people generally don't try to deliberately be rude. I want to just say a quick thank you to people who came along and took time to leave comments tonight um karen Co, pete fermo uh, robert van buren john newton steve troop so many of you if i've if i've missed out anyone then um you know tough colin mate you're right he's hilarious lindsay hope you get better soon mate thanks for coming along and listening listening and thanks for all your support and everything you do mate um hopefully you'll be back on your feet soon enough we are here um every week every monday at 7 p.m Please do keep tuning in and do listen to the mensradiostation.com website. Well, that's the end of another episode of Reading the Signs with me, Comedy John Ryan. We're here every Monday night at 7pm talking with comedians about mental wellness, mental well-being and just trying to get the conversation going. What we're trying to do is show that it's good to talk and we're also trying to show that everybody can go through the same experiences. 
A massive thank you to the WJ Group who sponsored the show, showing their commitment not just to mental well-being, but also to reaching as broad an audience as possible. It's great to be part of the mensradiostation.com family, so do check us out on the website on social media. We'll be back next Monday. You take care. Stay safe, everybody.